Chapter 17 Ross paced across his office as he watched the news reports on TV. He grimaced as they showed footage of the final explosion. The coverage switched to a reporter in a newsroom. Rumors continued to swirl about a clash between the U.S. military and an unknown adversary at Culver University earlier today, the reporter announced. The TV now showed a blonde reporter standing with two students on campus. Very few outside the military got a first-hand look at who or what the soldiers were fighting, she said. Sophomores Jack McGee and Jim Wilson were coming home from a hike and witnessed some of the battle. McGee captured this on his cell phone. The screen flashed an extremely grainy image of the creature. The reporter held up her microphone to the nearest student, Jack McGee. Can you describe what you saw? She asked. Dude, it was huge and green, McGee exclaimed. Dude, it was so big, Wilson agreed. It was like this huge hulk. The reporter faced the camera again. Further search for the mysterious hulk was delayed by powerful thunderstorms in Smoky Mountains National Park. Ross wheeled around when Spar entered his office. Sir, it's Blonsky, said Spar. Ross and Spar hustled toward the hospital ward. As they pushed through the ICU doors, Ross asked, Has anybody found out if he had next of kin or family? Spar held open the door for him. You can ask him yourself, she replied. A group of doctors and nurses backed away from Blonsky's bed as Ross entered, and Ross could see Blonsky sitting up, laughing. One of the nurses was taking off a metal splint from his hand. He was completely healed. Ross reconsidered what he'd thought earlier about the super soldier serum. Apparently, it had made Blonsky tougher than Ross had thought. Blonsky grinned when he saw Ross. Sir, he said. Ross approached Blonsky and looked him over, astounded by the recovery. There wasn't a mark on him, and considering what Blonsky had looked like when they'd medevaced him back here, that was nothing short of incredible. Good to see you back on your feet, soldier. Thank you, sir, Blonsky said. Ross kept looking at him, gauging his health from how Blonsky sat, how his eyes tracked everything in the room, and how the smile on his face didn't really hide the expression of a man who wanted revenge. How do you feel? Ross asked. Blonsky's grin widened. Ready for round three, he replied. Betty emptied the contents of her purse onto the motel bedspread. She had a phone, a credit and debit card, her driver's license, forty dollars in cash, some makeup, her university ID and a digital camera. Betty shrugged. I thought if you asked me to go, I ought to be ready. Bruce smiled, touched that she was prepared to join him. He collected everything from the bedspread except the money and the camera and put them back into her purse. Basically, we can't use any of this because they can track all of it, he said. How about my lip gloss? Betty joked. Can they track that? With a laugh, Bruce said, No, you can keep that. And I need my glasses, she added. You can... Bruce stopped as he realized she was having fun with him. We can use most of it, he corrected himself. We just can't use the credit cards, the ID, or the phone. Don't even turn the phone on. Betty looked down at the money in his hand. How will we get where we need to go on $40 and no credit cards? Bruce looked down at the floor. He didn't have an answer for her. We can sell this, Betty said. She removed a chain from her neck, pulling up a lovely gold pendant. Bruce knew she had gotten it as an inheritance from her mother. No, Bruce said firmly. It's the only thing you have left from her. No. Well, we'll have to try to get it back, Betty said. In that moment, Bruce realized how lucky he was to have her on his side. Ross stood in the Pentagon planning room, looking over the team he had assembled as Spar wrapped up the briefing on the banner situation. They all stared up at Bruce's and Betty's photos on the projection screen. 
Federal is already monitoring phone, plastic, and Dr. Ross's web accounts, and local police have been on alert, Spar continued. They'll pop up somewhere, and when they do, it comes straight to us. Ross cleared his throat. They're not gonna just pop up, he interjected. Banner made it five years and got across borders without making a mistake. He won't use a credit card now. If he was trying to escape, he'd be long gone. He's not trying to disappear this time. He's looking for help. The general raised a hand and closed it into a fist. That's how we're going to get him. We know what they're after, and we know he's been talking to somebody. You all have copies of the correspondence. The aliases Mr. Green and Mr. Blue have been added to the S.H.I.E.L.D. operations database. If he comes up for air, we'll be waiting. If he makes a peep, we'll hear him. And when he slips up, we'll be ready. Betty counted out cash to the young guy working at the counter at a gas station. While the clerk was distracted, Bruce stepped into the attached garage and spotted a greasy-looking computer terminal on a desk. He plugged the USB drive into the computer. He didn't have time to download the chat software, and also he couldn't attach files that way. Mr. Blue needed data, and Mr. Green wanted him to have it. So Bruce typed a quick email to an address at Greyburn College, where he knew Mr. Blue worked. He used a subject line guaranteed to get Mr. Blue's attention. File from Mr. Green. The message was simple. Mr. Blue, here's the data. It's time to meet. Mr. Green. Then he uploaded the data from the drive and sent it off. Betty came out of the store as he exited the garage. She held up a set of keys and smiled, pointing at a battered pickup truck. As Bruce removed the for sale sign from the window and tossed it in the back of the truck, Betty said, Hey! Bruce faced her, then grimaced when he saw her holding up the camera. It's been worse than this before, right? Betty asked. Yes, Bruce replied. Much worse. And you're not just running now, Betty continued. We're on the way to something better. So smile. Bruce tried, but he was afraid he didn't give her much of a smile to work with. But she snapped the picture anyway. They were still on the highway as night fell. Betty drove, and Bruce leaned his head against the passenger side window. Betty took a deep breath. What is it like, she asked. When it happens, what do you experience? Remember those experiments we volunteered for at Harvard? Those induced hallucinations? It's a lot like that. Just a thousand times amplified. It's like someone's poured a liter of acid into my brain. It was a scary thing to hear. But Betty went on. She loved Bruce and wanted him to know that she was with him for whatever he needed her to hear and whatever he needed her to do. Do you remember anything? she asked. Just fragments, images. There's too much noise. I could never derive much out of it. But then it's still you, inside him, Betty said. No, no, it's not, Bruce responded curtly. Betty let that sit before replying. I don't know, she began. In the cave, I really felt like it knew me. Maybe your mind is in there. It's just overcharged and can't process what's happening. I don't want to control it. I want to get rid of it, Bruce said sullenly. Betty wanted to say more, but she could tell Bruce was shutting down. He couldn't come to grips with the creature inside him and Betty knew if she was in his shoes, she would probably have had the same trouble. Bruce turned away from her, staring out the window into the darkness. All he could see was his own reflection. Chapter 18 In a secret medical lab, Blonsky sat back on a hospital bed. Two nearby technicians prepared syringes of super-soldier serum, while another one hooked Blonsky up to monitors. Ross stepped up to the edge of the bed. You ready? he asked. Blonsky smiled. 
Let's even the playing field a little, he replied. In her office in a building across the base from the medical facility, Major Spar looked up. Shield's search computer had turned up a hit on the term Mr. Blue. She clicked on the result and ran down all possible avenues. Got him, she thought. This had to be the guy Bruce was going to see. Bruce woke up in the truck sometime in the afternoon. They were inching down the highway into heavy traffic, and he couldn't tell how long he'd been asleep. On the radio, an announcer softly recited the news. Bruce, wake up, Betty said. There's something going on. Bruce peered out the front windshield at the traffic jam. The reporter on the radio mentioned traffic delays due to a heightened security alert, and Bruce opened his door and looked out. Far ahead, he could see the gates of a toll booth at the entrance of the Holland Tunnel. Uniformed officers stood by the gates, staring at faces in the cars, slowly passing by the checkpoint. We've got to go, Bruce decided. Betty glanced at him in alarm. Walk toward the back, Bruce said. Just don't move too fast. Both of them exited the truck, abandoning it on the road. Picking their way through the slow lines of honking cars, they headed for the shoulder and hiked down a gravelly slope. They made their way through an industrial area of Jersey City to the edge of the Hudson River. There, Bruce spotted a dock in the distance. They approached one of the fishermen, a tall guy with a mop of gray hair who was leaning against a railing with a fishing pole. Betty chatted with him, offering him some money. The fisherman nodded. A few minutes later, they took a seat in a small outboard motorboat. The fisherman throttled the engine, and Bruce and Betty faced forward as they puttered out onto the river. The Statue of Liberty and New York City shimmered in the sunlight across the water. They docked near Battery Park, thanked the fisherman, and walked up onto the streets of the city. Ten or fifteen minutes later, they'd gotten as far as Chambers Street. Betty and Bruce stopped by a map kiosk to figure out the best route to their destination. It's a long way uptown. Betty pointed out. I think the subway's probably quickest. Bruce chuckled. Me in a crowded metal tube, underground, with hundreds of other people in the most aggressive city in the world? Right, said Betty. Let's get a cab. The cab driver who picked them up was easily the most reckless driver in a city full of reckless drivers. Betty gasped as the taxi slashed wildly across two lanes on 6th Avenue, the driver slammed on the brakes randomly, honked his horn every few seconds, nearly killed a bike messenger, and sped through yellow lights instead of slowing down for them. The radio blared music while the driver jabbered on his cell phone. Bruce and Betty slammed around in the back seat. Bruce's new pulse monitor beeped as his heart rate climbed past 97 beats per minute, up to 98, then 99. He put his head back and closed his eyes, breathing deeply. The cab screeched to a halt near Columbus Circle in midtown Manhattan, bumping into the curb by an entrance to Central Park. They weren't close to their destination, but they couldn't stand that insane ride any longer. Betty chucked a few bills through the passenger side window. Are you out of your mind? That was the worst cab ride I've ever had, she yelled. The driver just made a kissing noise and screeched away. Betty kicked the rear bumper as it passed her. Jerk, she yelled, letting out all her pent-up frustration. You know, Bruce suggested softly, I know a few techniques that could help you manage that anger very effectively. You zip it, Betty snapped. We're walking. Okay, Bruce said. Chapter 19 Outside Greyburn College's science building, Professor Stearns walked down the front steps, shuffling a stack of papers in his hands. Betty hurried over to him. Excuse me, Dr. Stearns, she said. Sorry to bother you. I'm Elizabeth Ross. Dr. Stearns stared at her in surprise. Oh, Dr. Ross, he replied with a gasp. I devoured your paper on synthesizing myostatin. To what do I owe the pleasure? Betty waved to Bruce, who strode up the stairs to join them. I have someone who would like to meet you, Betty.
Betty said. Okay, Stern said as Bruce approached. Bruce stuck out his hand for the professor to shake. It's Mr. Blue, isn't it? Dr. Stern's mouth dropped open. Mr. Green! Up in Dr. Stern's office, Bruce and Betty stepped through a mad scientist's clutter of books, papers, chemical models, and scientific equipment. There was nowhere for guests to sit, so they stood in front of the professor's messy desk. Dr. Stearns plopped down in his desk chair, chattering away happily. I've got to tell you, I've been wondering if you were even real, he said. And if you were, what would it look like? A person with that much power lurking in him. Nothing could have surprised me more than this unassuming man shaking my hand. But look, we're not strolling into the park for a picnic here. Even if everything goes perfectly, if we induce an episode, if we get the dosage exactly right, is that going to be a lasting cure or just some antidote to suppress that specific flare-up? He mimed, flipping a coin. I don't know. Stern's expression grew serious. What I'm saying is, if we overshoot by even a small integer, these concentrations carry extraordinary levels of toxicity. You mean it could kill him, Betty translated. Kill him? Yeah, Stearns agreed. I should say so. Betty and Bruce glanced at each other. It sounded like a big decision to make, but Bruce would try anything if it meant never losing control to the Hulk again. You should know that there's a flip side to this, too, Bruce said. If we miss on the low side, if we induce me and the antidote fails, it will be very dangerous for you, he warned them. Dr. Stearns chuckled and shrugged off the warning. Look, I've always been far more curious than cautious, he said, and that served me pretty well. He clapped his hands together abruptly. So, are we going to do this? Betty and Bruce both nodded. Into the glorious unknown, Dr. Stearns cheered. At the Everglades base, helicopters were staging for the operation to take down Bruce. Flight crews did their final checks, and ground support techs checked boxes on their mission prep lists. Inside the barracks, Blonsky stood alone in a locker room, staring at himself in the mirror. He still looked as he always had, a smallish man, compact in build, not too muscular. He was the kind of men others always underestimated until they came up against him in a fight. But now, as he watched, his body began to change. The new dose of the super-soldier serum was taking hold. Blonsky watched, and he liked what he saw. It hurt, but nothing worth having was ever painless. And this? Oh, yes. It was worth having. Blonsky grinned crazily at himself in the mirror. A few hours later, he boarded a high-tech helicopter with a troop of other Special Forces soldiers. Besides him, there were three two-man shooting teams. Thermal scopes and rifles were racked against the wall. Blonsky sat across from a soldier who had been in the Culver University battle. How you feeling, man? The soldier asked him. Like a monster, Blonsky replied with a grin. Chapter 20 Dr. Stearns and Betty prepared Bruce's experimental procedure. Betty thought that the lab table looked disturbingly like a prison bed for administering lethal injections. The whole laboratory had a Dr. Frankenstein vibe that made her feel unnerved. Bruce stripped to his stretchy lycra shorts and handed his clothes to Betty. Think of all the money I'll save on wardrobe if this works he joked, when she didn't laugh. His expression grew solemn. If this starts to go bad, he said, promise me you won't try to help. Bruce, Betty began. It's the worst when it starts, he interrupted. You have to promise me you'll run or I can't do this. Betty nodded. Okay, on the table, Dr. Stern said. He pointed to the medical restraints on the lab table. If you have a strong reaction, these will keep you from hurting yourself. Bruce chuckled. 
He climbed up onto the table and lay down. You can tell me later if you thought it was strong. Dr. Stearns tilted the table back and attached the straps to Bruce's wrists and ankles. Betty helped him insert an IV linked to the cell saturation machine into each of Bruce's arms and legs. Dr. Stearns opened a canister containing the antidote and connected it to a plunger attached to the IV tubes. He pounded on one of the machines, saying something about his graduate students messing it up. Finally, Dr. Stearns stuck contact pads connected to electrical wires onto Bruce's temples. This will be a somewhat novel sensation, he said. He was flying high, ready to conduct the experiment of his professional lifetime. Bruce seemed calm. Betty was nervous, scared, in fact, but trying to keep a cool demeanor. Dr. Stearns pressed the switch and said, We have begun. The dialysis machine will mix the antidote with your blood, except the antidote will only take hold once we've achieved a full reaction. The IV tubes filled with a swirling mixture of Bruce's blood and the bluish antidote fluid. Just relax, Betty said. Bruce was breathing hard, but she couldn't tell exactly what he was feeling. Okay, we are comprehensive, Dr. Stern said. He handed Betty a bite guard, and she put it in Bruce's mouth. Then Dr. Stearns positioned himself at Bruce's head with a set of shock pads. All right, he said. We set to pop? Bruce looked at Betty. Stearns noticed they were holding hands and said to Betty, I'd take your hands off him. She did. Bruce was jolted with electricity. His body bucked with uncontrollable spasms, his muscles straining against the straps, his eyes clenched shut. Then Bruce's eyes snapped open, glowing with an intense green light. The pulse of vibrant green flashed in the base of Bruce's skull, and green gamma energy coursed through his body as his skin flooded with color. My goodness, Dr. Stearns blurted. He started to shut the procedure down, thinking it was complete. Wait, wait, there's more, Betty warned. Bruce writhed as the full force of the transformation hit him, and his muscles swelled, stretched, and hardened. His bones cracked as they adjusted to his new shape. Betty winced as Bruce howled with pain. Stearns covered his mouth, staggered by the changes. He stepped closer. The restraints popped like rubber bands around Bruce's thickening wrists. One strap slapped Dr. Stearns in the face, knocking him back as the Hulk appeared on the table, still shuddering with pain. Now, Betty yelled, do it! The lab table buckled under the giant's weight. He raised his head, growling, his eyes filled with rage. Betty jumped up onto the table and leaned against the creature's torso, staring directly into his furious green eyes. Bruce, Bruce, look at me. Stay with me, Betty said. He just roared. The antidote, now! Stearns, do it now! Betty screamed. Stearns turned back to the monitors, controlling the experiment. Bruce, look in my eyes, Betty said, trying to soothe him. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, Stern said. He ran and kicked the machine holding the canister of antidote fluid. With a whine, it started up, and the antidote started to flow down the tubes. For a long moment, it seemed to have no effect. But then, miraculously, the process started to reverse itself. The antidote flowed through the giant's veins, calming the radiation fire in his blood. The Hulk dwindled, and eventually he was gone. All that remained was a shivering, tired Bruce. Still kneeling above him, Betty stroked Bruce's forehead. Bruce, can you hear me? She whispered. She said his name again. He was drenched with sweat. It's okay, Betty whispered. You're okay. You did it. He's fine, Dr. Stern said amazed at what he was seeing on the monitors. This is fantastic. It's over, Betty said. Bruce got his eyes focused on her. Hi, he said. 
She smiled. Hi. After Bruce felt well enough to discuss the experiment, Dr. Stearns gave his take on how it had gone. He was even more animated than he had been before they'd started. That was the most extraordinary thing I have seen in my entire life. Okay, you know what? Stop, please, Betty cut in. We need to go back and talk about what just happened in there. Absolutely. Okay. The gamma pulse came from the amygdala, Dr. Stern said, hammering out combinations of keystrokes at a nearby terminal. I think Dr. Ross's primer lets the cells absorb the energy temporarily, and then it abates. Looking at Bruce, he added, that's why you didn't die of radiation sickness years ago. Now maybe we've neutralized those cells permanently, or maybe we just suppressed that event, Stern said rapidly. I'm inclined to think the latter, but it's hard to know because none of our test subjects survived. Of course, they weren't getting the primer. Bruce sat up. Wait, wait, what did you just say? They weren't getting the myostatin primer, Stern said. No, no, no. Test subjects? This was the first Bruce had ever heard of this. What test subjects? Dr. Stearns jumped up and said, Come with me. Flanked by New York Police Department cars, Ross's team arrived at the perimeter of the Greyburn College campus and deployed. Sniper teams took roof positions around the Greyburn College lab building. Each team consisted of one shooter and one spotter with a thermal scanner. In the command van nearby, Ross and Spar watched as their monitors lit up with readouts from those scanners. Thermal images of Betty, Bruce, and Stearns moving through the lab. Target is the tallest, Spar told the snipers, standing in the middle. Downstairs in the Greyburn Science Building, an NYPD SWAT officer hustled a chunky security guard out of the lobby and Blonsky and his team marched into position by the elevators. We still don't know which was more toxic, the gamma or your blood, Stearns was saying as he led them into a different room next to his lab. It was lined floor to ceiling with glass shelves holding refrigerated blood samples. What do you mean my blood? Bruce asked. Stearns stopped and looked back at him. Bruce, this is all you. You didn't send me much to work with, so I had to concentrate it and make more. With a little more trial and error, there's no end to what we can do. This gamma technology has limitless applications. He led them through the lab, filled with thousands of samples of Bruce's blood, cloned using technology Bruce had never seen. This is potentially Olympian, Stearns crowed. We'll unlock hundreds of cures. We will make humans impervious to disease. Pure horror darkened Bruce's face. This was his worst nightmare coming true. The Hulk in his blood was now loose in these test tubes. No, no, we've got to destroy it, Bruce broke in. Wait, what? What? Dr. Stearns sputtered. All of it, Bruce insisted. Tonight, we're going to incinerate it. Is this the whole supply? Dr. Stearns gulped, and his cheerful expression vanished. But he whined. We could get the Nobel Prize for this. Bruce shook his head firmly. You don't understand the power of this thing. It is too dangerous. It cannot be controlled. But we've got the antidote now, Dr. Stearns argued. This is Promethean fire. From the rooftop nearby, the snipers watched Bruce move in front of the window. They raised their rifles in anticipation. Then Betty shifted in front of Bruce, blocking the clean shot. At your discretion, shooter, Spar told the snipers. She was listening in to Dr. Stern's raving and thought the best thing to do would be to take them all out. But she had her orders. Almost, one sniper reported over the radio. No, no shot. Downstairs, Blonsky lost his patience and bolted into a stairwell, Spar saw him on one of the other soldiers' cameras. She turned to General Ross. Blonsky's going in. Blonsky, stand down, Ross ordered. My daughter's in there. But Blonsky was jumping up the stairs with astounding leaps, running up eight flights in seconds. He jumped up whole floors from railing to railing, moving so fast 
Spar had a hard time tracking his progress. Back in the lab, Stearns was trying to convince Bruce that everything was under control. We have the antidote now, Stearns protested. They don't want the antidote, Bruce yelled at Dr. Stearns. They want to make it a weapon, and if we let it go, we will never get it back. You don't have any idea how powerful this thing is. Dr. Stearns waved his hands, dismissing Bruce's concerns. Oh, I hate the government just as much as anyone, he said, but you're being a little paranoid, don't you think? Bam! A hole appeared in the window pane behind Bruce. Bruce's eyes suddenly glazed over. He turned to reveal a tranquilizer dart sticking out the back of his neck. Dr. Stearns screamed. Chapter 21 Bruce's knees buckled, but Betty caught him before he fell. Then Blonsky burst through the lab door. No! Betty screamed. She jumped in front of Bruce. Blonsky smiled and shoved her aside, hard. Betty smashed into one of the lab cases. The glass shattered, and she cried out with pain. Bruce's eyes flashed with anger, but they dimmed as he struggled to focus. With a crazy laugh, Blonsky grabbed the front of Bruce's shirt and shook him. Blonsky glared into Bruce's hazy eyes. Come on, he shouted. Where is it? He smacked Bruce across the face. When he didn't get a reaction, Blonsky smacked him again. Three more soldiers burst into the lab. Blonsky, one commando shouted. Show it to me! Blonsky screamed at Bruce and slapped him one more time. When Bruce didn't move, Blonsky backhanded him in the head, knocking him out cold. The alley behind the lab was closed off by police vehicles. The command van backed up to the sidewalk outside the lab, its doors open. Spar and Ross watched as Bruce, bound by enormous wrist shackles, was rolled out of the building on a gurney. There was a thick, cold pack on his head where Blonsky hit him, and amazingly, he was awake, but groggy. Two soldiers escorted the gurney into the back of the van. Betty had walked out of the building with the gurney, her wrist in a splint. Lingering to consult with a military medic behind her, she let Bruce go ahead of her. As the gurney reached Ross, he stopped it and looked down into Bruce's dizzy eyes. Ross whispered, if you took it from me, I'll put you in a hole for the rest of your life. When Betty saw her father talking to Bruce, she hurried over, and Ross quickly waved the gurney into the van. Betty, Ross began. She turned around and said, I will never forgive what you've done to him. He's a fugitive, Ross said. You made him a fugitive to cover your failures and protect your career, Betty said her voice low and angry. Don't ever speak to me as your daughter again. It's only because you're my daughter that you're not in handcuffs too, Ross said, hiding his feelings as best he could. Betty turned her back on him, strode after the gurney, climbing up into the ambulance. Ross just watched her go. Spar was upstairs in the lab questioning Dr. Stearns. Are you telling me you can make more like him? No, not yet. Stearns dabbed at the bridge of his nose, which had been cut by flying glass. I sorted out a few pieces, but it's not like I can put together the same Humpty Dumpty, if that's what you're asking. He was a freak accident. The goal is to do it better. Spar nodded. So Banner's the only one we've got to worry about. She jerked suddenly, her eyes rolling. Then she slumped to the floor. Blonsky was standing behind her. He'd just slammed her with the handle of his knife. Why are you always hitting people? Dr. Stearns gasped. Click. Blonsky pulled out a nasty-looking pistol, cocking it in Dr. Stearns' face. Now what could I have possibly done to deserve such aggression? Stearns said, trying to sound defiant. It's not what you've done. It's what you're going to do, Blonsky said. I want what you got out of Banner. I want that. Dr. Stearns peered at Blonsky. His face changed. 
and he stood up, suddenly unafraid of the gun. You've got something extra in you already, don't you? I want more, Blonsky said. You've seen what he becomes, right? I have, Dr. Stearns replied. It's beautiful. Godlike. Well, I want that. I need that. Make me that, Blonsky said. His face was contorted, like there was something inside of him that he didn't know how to let out. Dr. Stearns raised his eyebrows. I don't know what you've got inside you already. The mix could be an abomination. Blonsky grabbed Dr. Stearns by the front of his shirt and lifted him straight up in the air with one arm. His other hand still held the gun. I didn't say I was unwilling, Dr. Stearns gasped. I just need informed consent. Blonsky lowered him. And you've given it, Dr. Stearns said. Minutes later, Blonsky was lying on the lab table and Dr. Stearns had hooked him up to the cell saturation machine. The professor rapidly attached a Mr. Green blood canister to the infusion port and then slid the gamma machine's emitter into place. Blonsky looked up at his reflection in the silver disk of the emitter and saw white crosshairs moving over his forehead. When the procedure began... Everything started to go wrong right away. The surge of energy from Blonsky's body sent all the lab machinery into a frenzy of short circuits and blinking lights. The power went out in part of the lab. This is what I was trying to explain, Stearns cried out over the noise. I don't know what you've been ladling into yourself. He turned around and was stunned at what he saw. Blonsky was no longer on the table, and something was moving in the darkened part of the lab. Stearns could see enough to tell that it was no ordinary human. He could hear the difference, too. This thing growled like he imagined a dragon or some other mythological beast might. But clearly it worked, he said, and swallowed. His throat was suddenly dry. Let's assume you don't understand a word I'm saying. But if you'll just get back on the table, I can fix this. The monster that had been Emil Blonsky stepped out of the shadows. It laughed, a sound like rocks grinding together, and swatted Dr. Stearns aside. As it left the lab, there were sounds of gunfire from the soldiers standing guard. Stearns lay where he had fallen, his eyes glazed from the blow he had taken. Some of the banner blood dripped onto his head from the cracked canister, and as he lay there, Dr. Samuel Stearns began to change as well. The helicopter buzzed through the night sky over the Hudson River. Ross sat up front with his intelligence team, while Bruce and Betty sat on benches across from each other in the rear, both flanked by soldiers. Betty tapped Bruce's foot with her own, trying to reassure him without drawing anyone's attention. The radio crackled. Delta Ford, a leader, cried a panicky voice. They took out two of our guys. Repeat, two of our guys. Blonsky and the Major are still inside. On the radio, they could all hear the sounds of explosions and chaos. The radio squawked with an enormous crash and a bone-chilling roar of rage. The Hulk is in the street! Repeat, the Hulk is in the street! The soldier cried into the radio. Ross glanced down the helicopter interior at Bruce, who stared back at him. That's impossible, Ross said into the radio. You get hold of yourself, young man. You get it together. What is your position? 121st Street, headed north on Broadway, the soldier shouted. Turn us around, Ross ordered. The helicopter banked sharply. We're going back, Bruce said. Why are we going back? Give me eyes down there, Ross barked. Yes, sir. On Ross's screen appeared the feed from one of the soldiers' cameras. It showed a giant figure rampaging through the streets. Like the Hulk. Only bigger. Much bigger. Chapter 22 
the helicopter swooped toward Harlem, where explosions and commotion could already be seen from the air. Ross stared at the video monitors as the soldier raced up a street parallel to the creature who was wreaking havoc. He caught a glimpse of the monster's rear flank, with smashed cars rolling in its wake, but then it disappeared behind a building. It had looked Hulk-like, but the view had been too brief. I said get me eyes on that thing, Ross shouted. Bruce pushed past the soldier guarding him and joined Ross by the monitors. Betty quickly followed. On the monitor, the vehicle had reached 125th Street. It slammed on the brakes, and the video picture lurched around. When the image settled, Ross's, Bruce's, and Betty's jaws dropped. They could see a massive, brownish-green creature gleefully causing chaos. Pedestrians fled in panic, and cars skidded, smashing into hydrants. "'Sir, are you seeing this?' the soldier called. "'Is that Banner?' he continued, his voice trembling. "'It's not Banner,' Ross snapped. "'Hold position!' The monster stomped toward the vehicle, and the occupants of the helicopter got their first good look. The creature was at least fourteen feet tall and ridiculously muscled. He was as brawny as the Hulk, but he had strange bone spurs protruding along his ankles and wrists and down his spine. The camera panned up to his snarling face, a face they all instantly recognized. One of yours? Bruce asked. He knew the answer, but he wanted to hear Thunderbolt Ross say it out loud. Oh my God, Betty said. What have you done? On the streets... Police and soldiers were hitting this new abomination with everything they had, but nothing worked. The two soldiers in the vehicle unloaded on it with a rocket-propelled grenade. It didn't even flinch. But they did get Blonsky's attention. He charged down the street after the automobile, which slammed into reverse and roared away back south. Get out of there, soldier, Ross commanded. But the abomination was too fast. It ran close to the vehicle, which was caroming off parked cars as it fled in reverse. The abomination picked up a taxicab and held it overhead. Huge fireballs backlit the creature, showing off its spines and the bones interlaced with its huge muscles. The soldier's camera tracked it all. The abomination loomed over the camera. He leered down, holding the taxicab high. Give me a real fight, he roared. Then he brought the taxi down. The camera fuzzed out and the monitor went black. Ross, Bruce, and Betty sat in silence. Then the radio squawked again. General, a communications officer said, the NYPD want to know what to use against it. What do you want me to tell them? Sir? Ross stared silently at the dead monitor. Sir? The communications officer prompted again over the radio. Ross shook off his shock. Tell them to bring everything they've got and head for Harlem, he ordered. He lowered his head. And heaven help them, he whispered. The general's face was tired and grim. He knew the military had no way to fight the monster. It has to be me, Bruce said, knowing there was no other choice. You have to take me back there. What are you saying? Betty asked him. You think you can control it? No, not control it, but, I don't know, maybe aim it. And what if you can't? Ross snapped. We made this thing, all of us, Bruce said. Please. Ross closed his eyes, then slowly nodded his head. Land us near it, he instructed the pilot. No, no, keep us high, Bruce interrupted. Open the back door. Ross nodded. A soldier hit a button and the ramp of the helicopter hinged open. Cool air rushed inside. Bruce hurried toward the rear, still locked in the wrist shackles. Put me over it, he instructed. Go higher. The helicopter surged upward and the city dropped away. Bruce peered down from the open door. New York was 3,000 feet below them glowing in the darkness. Another explosion boomed up in Harlem, but from that height, Bruce couldn't hear the screams. Bruce, stop! What are you doing? Betty yelled. Think about this. 
You don't even know if you'll change. She had hold of his arm. You don't have to do this. Please, this is insane. Betty, I've got to try, Bruce said. I'm sorry. He kissed her, letting his lips linger on hers. And then he let go, falling back out of the open cargo door. The wind whooshed around him as he tumbled down toward 125th Street. He closed his eyes and let himself fall. He fell. And fell. Nothing happened. No burst of energy or anger or power. Nothing. Bruce's eyes snapped open. Uh-oh, he thought. He plunged at unbelievable speed toward the street below. Chapter 23 Bruce Banner crashed into the Harlem street in an explosion of asphalt and dirt, leaving a very deep, rough hole in the pavement. Down the street, the abomination was inflicting terrible destruction on the city, and civilians running from his path dodged the hole in the ground from all directions. A mighty green hand and arm rose up and grabbed the hole's ragged edge, crushing the street with its grip. The Hulk emerged from the ground. All around were police lights flashing, people running, sirens blaring, and explosions detonating in the distance. A police chopper aimed its spotlight on the abomination down the street. The Hulk staggered, unable to stand the sensory overload of a city in chaos. But then the Hulk closed his eyes, grimacing against the madness. He strained, all his muscles flexing, and he let out a roar, shaking his head to clear it. Now he could concentrate on his target, the abomination, the enemy. The Hulk stood tall and bellowed at his adversary, his roar shaking the street. The abomination turned around and saw the Hulk. His gray eyes shimmered with malicious recognition. Hulk, he growled. Hurtling toward each other, the two giants collided so powerfully that the windows of the surrounding storefronts shattered. The theater's marquee exploded into a fountain of sparks. The abomination tackled the Hulk, knocking him off his feet, and they tumbled down the street toward Broadway, ripping up the asphalt as they rolled. The abomination got his feet first and flung Hulk away. The force of the impact on the ground staggered the Hulk, who took a moment to recover his senses. Just then, the abomination approached, striding through the fires blazing in the wrecked cars that littered the street. Come on, the abomination said, beckoning. The Hulk turned to a police car abandoned nearby. Its wailing siren irritated him. He smashed it down flat and then tore it in half, holding the two halves as he had held the pieces of the sculpture the last time he'd faced Blonsky. He charged at the abomination and began to beat him with the pieces of the car. The abomination lost his balance and landed on his back. The Hulk pounded him with the car until it came apart, then pounded him with his fists. The pavement was cracked and caved in all around them. The abomination turned his head and spat. Then he said, Is that all you've got? The Hulk reared back to deliver another punch, and the abomination got his revenge for the fight in the field. He kicked the Hulk so hard that Hulk's flying body punched straight through the nearest building. The abomination rumbled down the street, accelerated like a long jumper, and soared up into the side of the first building, digging massive handholds into the bricks as he scaled the apartment. When he got to the hole left by the Hulk's body, he could see to the street on the other side. Above them, the helicopter buzzed low over Harlem. General Ross and Betty watched the battle from the copter. Betty gasped as she saw the Hulk crash through the building and come down behind it, pulverizing a large waste container when he landed. General Ross peered down from the helicopter over the gunner's narrow shoulder, narrowing his eyes as he saw the abomination climbing. Use that weapon, soldier, Ross ordered the gunner. Give him some help. Which one? the gunner asked. Shoot that one climbing the wall, Ross retorted. Which one do you think? 
Tracer fire streaked down in the dark as the gunner blasted the helicopter's cannon down at the abomination. Bricks exploded around the climbing creature. The abomination managed to reach the rooftop, where the gunner had a clearer shot. Cannon rounds streaked down at him, ripping up the roof. Some of the rounds ricocheted off the abomination's plate-like bones, but others stung him enough to slow him down. A little. The abomination headed for a water tower, sprinting across the roof with the helicopter tight overhead. Betty clung to the helicopter's ramp as it accelerated to keep up. Down in the alley, the Hulk heard the sound of firing above. He shook himself, growled, and then bounced off the close walls of the alley, scaling the space parkour style. When he reached the top, he jumped onto the remaining fire escape and pulled himself onto the roof. The helicopter hovered to his left, raining cannon fire down on the abomination's back. The abomination changed course, sprinting toward the helicopter as the Hulk got to the rooftop. The abomination ran to the edge of the building and jumped. Up on the ramp, Betty's eyes widened in fear. If the abomination hit the chopper, it would never survive the impact. The Hulk sprinted across the roof toward the abomination and lunged just as the creature jumped. He caught the abomination's legs, dragging him down so that all the beast could do was catch hold of one of the helicopter's landing skids. The machine lurched and spun around as the pilot tried to keep control with an extra two tons of the Hulk and the Abomination struggling below. I can't hold it, the pilot shouted. I've got to put it down. Betty lurched across the rear ramp, barely managing to hang on. They had gotten close to the Greyburn College campus again. The helicopter spun and pitched in the air. Below it, the Hulk and the Abomination collided with rooftop cisterns and the corners of buildings. The helicopter was going to crash. The rear rotor had failed, and it was a miracle it hadn't gone down in flames already. Inside the copter, Ross hung onto his chair, his jaw set firmly. Betty closed her eyes. Chapter 24 the helicopter spun wildly around its main rotor, narrowly clearing the top of the college's library. It skittered into the dome of the main hall and crashed down into the plaza. Betty was hurled toward the front of the cabin as the tail rotor sheared off and the rear ramp crumpled like a crushed can. The abomination was under the copter when it hit the ground. Its rotors shattered against his back. The hulk had tumbled free. Inside, Betty recovered her senses first. She saw her father wedged up against the pilot's chair. Dad, are you hurt? Let me help you. I'm all right, General Ross groaned. Just find a way out. The crashed helicopter shook as the abomination climbed on top of it, finding the hulk in the main plaza of Greyburn College. The abomination leaped off the copter and slammed the hulk against a marble wall, pounding his body like a boxer against the ropes. The Hulk clinched him to stop the pummeling, their faces inches apart, teeth bared with strain. He struggled against the abomination's grip, but could not get free. Behind the creature, Hulk saw Betty trying to get out of the crashed helicopter. The abomination guessed where he was looking, and his grin got even wider. You don't deserve this power the abomination said with a leer. Now watch her die. The abomination raised his gigantic right forearm and pinned it against the Hulk's throat, the elbow spike driving into the flesh of the Hulk's chest right above his thumping heart. The marble wall cracked behind the Hulk's head. Blood poured down the Hulk's chest, but he found a reserve of strength in his desperation to save Betty Fire was spreading in the wrecked helicopter, and its fuel tanks were leaking on the plaza. Soon it would explode. The Hulk caught both of the Abomination's wrists in his hands and forced them apart, roaring with the exertion. He drove his knee up into the beast's belly twice, knocking the breath out of him. Then he pivoted and drove the Abomination headfirst into the wall. The Abomination was stunned for a moment, and the Hulk leaped clear, just as the first spark hit the spreading pool of helicopter fuel with a blinding whoosh of flame. 
Halfway there, the Hulk saw that he wouldn't be able to beat the explosion. Still running, he slammed his hands together in a thunderous clap. The shockwave blew the fire out and rocked everyone inside, but their lives were saved. They staggered to their feet. Betty gasped as she heard a crackling, rattling sound from behind the Hulk and saw the abomination had gotten up again. Look out, she cried. The Hulk turned, but not in time. A tremendous blow to the side of his head bowled him over. He tried to rise, dazed, staring up at the abomination looming above him. The abomination had fashioned a weapon out of a chain with two huge steel weights at one end. He swung it over his head like a nunchuck, and the weights smashed the Hulk to the side again. He lay sprawled, trying to get his feet under him again, but the blow would have knocked the library building down. The Hulk couldn't just shake it off. Now the abomination advanced on the helicopter, again whirling the huge steel weights over his head. General, he said, gloating. Any last words? He raised his arms, ready to bring the weights down and crush the helicopter to fragments, with Betty, General Ross, and the rest of the crew in it. General Ross didn't offer any words, but the Hulk did. The Hulk struggled to his knees, then pulled his feet under himself in a squat and roared, Hulk! Smash! As the abomination swung his weapon, the Hulk smashed his enormous fists into the ground to throw his enemy off balance. The force of the Hulk's fists formed a canyon in the ground. The abomination stumbled and slipped straight through the crack in the ground. As he fell, the chain from his weapon swung free through the air, circling the abomination's enormous neck. The Hulk didn't hesitate. He launched himself on the abomination and yanked the chain tightly. He dragged the abomination back with all his strength as the abomination fought, lashing his fists and elbows backward to pound the Hulk's head and shoulders. But the Hulk was too angry to care. He was going to end this now. The abomination would never hurt anyone or threaten anyone again. But Betty had gotten out of the helicopter, and now she stood in front of the Hulk and screamed out, Stop! The abomination hung limp in Hulk's grip, but he was not dead yet. The Hulk paused and looked at Betty. Then, incredibly, he let the overcome abomination drop to the ground. Around them, soldiers and police officers lowered their weapons. The Hulk and Betty walked to each other amid the wreckage. Betty looked up at him. It's okay, she said. The Hulk reached out and stroked her cheek, wiping away a tear from when she had been so scared that he would die. He looked at it, then looked back at her. Slowly, working hard for each syllable, he said, Betty. A helicopter spotlight pinned him, and he flinched. Then, with a last look at Betty, he turned and ran, bounding across the rooftops to escape. Betty watched him go. Then she turned to General Ross. He was watching her, and Betty knew he had seen the truth. The Hulk had turned into a hero. Epilogue Betty Ross stood at the railing looking south over New York Harbor from Battery Park City. She was thinking of the last time she had come this way, on the boat with Bruce from New Jersey. She wondered what had ever happened to that pickup they'd driven up from Tennessee and then abandoned at the mouth of the Holland Tunnel. And she wondered what had happened to Bruce. She still had the picture of him on her camera, from right before they got into the truck. She kept it. She would always keep it. And the next time she saw Bruce, she would take another one. He would come back when he was ready. When he could really control the Hulk. Betty knew. She would wait. In a cabin in the wilderness of western Canada, Bruce got his mail. There was a small package addressed to David B. 
which was the name Bruce had used in a certain business transaction. He opened the package and removed the necklace Betty had pawned for traveling money. He'd looked for quite a while before tracking it down, but now he had it. Bruce sealed it in an envelope, addressed it to Betty, and put a stamp on the envelope. He would mail it in the morning, and when Betty got it, she would know he was thinking of her. Then Bruce meditated. Every day he got a little better at keeping the beast inside. But he wouldn't be able to hold it in forever. That wouldn't matter as long as he could control it. And where he had once meditated to hold the monster in, now Bruce was learning how to use meditation to bring the change into the Hulk when he wanted it. On his terms. He practiced. He kept practicing. One of these days, when he had it right, he would find Betty again. Just off base in Florida, Thunderbolt Ross finished his drink. He was not feeling good. The Super Soldier Project was a disaster, and so was General Thunderbolt Ross's career. The abomination had destroyed everything Ross had worked for, and to make matters worse, Bruce Banner was the one who had saved New York and Betty from the monster Emil Blonsky had become. The bartender came back and poured him another one. Ross could see himself in the mirror and didn't like what he saw. What was next? He'd have to retire. He'd put his feet up, go fishing, and have to chew on his failures for the rest of his life. And Betty still wouldn't talk to him. He had people watching her, and she hadn't been in touch with Bruce either. No one seemed to know where Bruce was. At moments like this, that suited Ross fine. Bruce Banner could fall right off the face of the earth, and it wouldn't bother Ross a bit. Someone else came in and walked up next to him. Mmm, the smell of defeat, he said. You know, I hate to say I told you so, General, but that super soldier program was put on ice for a reason. Ross knew without looking up that it was Tony Stark speaking to him. Stark, better known as Iron Man, was everything Thunderbolt Ross was not. He was rich, he was popular, he was a big shot inside S.H.I.E.L.D., and his Iron Man project unlike Ross's super-soldier project, was a roaring success. I've always felt hardware was much more reliable, Stark said. General Ross turned a weary glare on Stark's photogenic face. Stark. Stark nodded. General? Thunderbolt Ross didn't like Tony Stark, and both of them knew it, but occasionally they had been forced to work together. You always wear such nice suits, Ross said, mocking Tony's reliance on armored suits instead of his own strength. Tony looked down at himself. He was, in fact, wearing a nice suit. It had cost a lot of money. Touché, he said. I hear you have an unusual problem. You should talk, Ross said. He knew some of what had been going on at Stark Industries lately. You should listen, Stark said getting more serious. What if I told you we were putting a team together? Who's we? Ross asked. That's when Tony Stark sat down and started talking. <laughs>